just continue with this. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Any other new faces today? Ali, have you been here before? I don't remember seeing you. Or maybe you've been quiet. Uh, I've been here. I don't think I've had the camera on. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. And Nick is back from his tour of uh, tropical islands. Hi, Nick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Not so far away, though. Still pretty close. Yeah. Well, when you're in Queensland, tropical islands are easy. By default. <laughs> Hi, Marie. Nice to see you. Where are you joining us from? Hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Absolutely. Hi. Um, I'm joining from South Bank, Brisbane. Uh-huh. Yeah, Great. I'm at the um, Children's Health Queensland Hospital building. Ah, yes. OK. Great. Um, Anybody got anything they wanted to talk about or ask about before we dive in? Because I've got some good news, which is I've made mm -hmm. things much easier <laughs> than the horrible direction we went last time. All right, sounds like I should dive in then. Um, I know there was like, as I rather expected and quite fair enough, some some concern on the forum about how um, complicated and weird this all is, um, which is partly because we're kind of like jumping into stuff we'd normally do in part two. And so we haven't quite got the, um, yeah, the, all the necessary background here. Um, and so, yeah, don't worry if you're feeling a little <clears throat> um, at sea. Um, but it's a good way to like, I don't know, start to see like some stuff you could look into after the course is finished. Um, All right, so let me just... Jeremy? Yes. Sorry, just on mentioning part two. Are you planning a part two this year? Um, planning would be too strong a word, but uh, in as much as I ever plan Think, anything... Thinking about? <laughs> yes, I would absolutely like to do a part two this year. Awesome. And the fact that you're asking that question means that you are not up to date on our Discord, so you should definitely join our Discord channel because True. we've actually been talking about doing a... Um, conference uh, or an unconference to go with mm. part two at the end of the year in Queensland. Um, okay, and awesome. a lot of folks from places that are not in Australia are saying they would be up for coming coming here for that. Um, you know, partly a kind of a social thing um, and uh, also trying to do it all in a very COVID safe way of kind of outdoor and masked and people tested ahead of time and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, so nothing's planned, like we don't have dates or a syllabus or anything like that, but we absolutely hope to have something awesome maybe towards the end of the year um, where we can get to, yeah, get to know each other a bit better and get to know fast AI and deep learning a bit better. Uh, oh, Jeremy, and, yes. and can I ask you, um, are you going to continue um, this walkthrough um, next week? Because I know that the class is going to resume next Tuesday. Yeah, um, I, I think so. Okay. Like the fact that I'm doing it this week is interesting because, yeah, like I, it, it, it has meant I've got less time to actually work on the course, but I also feel like the stuff we're doing perhaps is stuff I can do use in the next lesson, depending on where we get to. So, um, yeah, so I think we'll do it next week. We'll see how things go. If I get really behind, then maybe not. Um, but then mm -hmm. I certainly plan to like continue the, the, doing them after the last class, mm -hmm. you know, until, I don't know, we all know everything, I guess, and then mm -hmm. we'll stop. <laughs> At which point there'll be more things to know. So, yeah. Okay. We, we, yeah. we don't have to stop necessarily, you know, there's just so much to learn. <laughs> the, the, the only problem is that it's uh, obviously a burden on your time, but it's, you know, super I enjoy it. No, I enjoy it. My, my, my issue is what about when we get to the point where there's nothing left to learn, Radek? What do we do then? You know, well, uh, <laughs> well, but is there such a point? <laughs> uh, sure, there must, you know, there's. But then we just start doing it all in a different language, right? We start doing it all in, in R or Julia. Yeah, or something. correct. <laughs> C++, that would keep us busy. 
You know, uh, I think this is my fifth year of doing fast AI courses, and I'm still trying to complete the, you know, part one. Oh, you're too modest, Eric. Oh, no, it's true. Uh, all right. Let me see. So, multitask. All right. Um, I am just so happy about how this worked out, to be honest. Um, although, spoiler alert, it didn't turn out to help our score. Um, the score was about the same. So, but I was so happy at how the whole process turned out. Um, and I kind of want to show you how I got there as well as where we ended up. Um, and yeah, as soon as I kind of like turned off Zoom last time and I went for a walk, and then as soon as I went, did that, I was like, oh, now I, of course, I know how we should do this. And um, really, uh, so there's quite a few, but you know, we can make this much, much simpler. So let me explain what we're going to try to do. Um, we are going to try to um, predict um, two things, uh, the disease and the variety for each image. And the first thing will be to create a pair of data loaders that look like this. For each image, they will have connected two mm -hmm. things to them, the disease and the type of rice. So this is going to be step one, right? So let me sh kind of show you how I got to that step. Um, so that step one that I took was to first of all, try to replicate what we've already had before, right? So Patty Small. Um, but before I used image data loaders, which is like a, that's the highest level, least flexible function. You know, we can do all the data processing in a single line of code, but only if we want to do something really standard. And trying to predict two things is not standard enough for it, right? So we now need to go one layer down. And um, there's like a lot of really good tutorials on docs.fast.ai. And because it's been ages since I've done any of this, I'd forgotten entirely how fast AI works. So I used them very heavily to remind myself of what's going on. Um, but for example, there is a data block tutorial. This pets tutorial is is great. It, like it goes through all the layers of like different ways of doing things with fast AI pre-processing. Um, this Siamese tutorial is another really good one. Uh, so these are some of the things I looked at. And the other thing that I looked at was the actual API docs. So if I click here on data block. Um, this is actually probably what I found the most useful in the end. Um, there's lots of great examples in the documentation. So yeah, I, you know, as a kind of like, you know how it is, you come back to something a couple of years after you built it and you're now kind of the customer of your documentation. And so my experience as a customer of my documentation was I was really delighted by it. So I can definitely suggest checking all that out. Um, so you know, what you can do before we were using image data loaders from folder. So if we just do the double question mark trick, we can see the source code for it, you know, and it's the normal size of fast AI things. It's very small. And you can see that actually all the work's being done by data block. So um, data block is the like, you know, still high level API, but not, not as high level. It's actually very flexible. And so we're going to, um, Step, step one that I did was to replicate exactly what we had before, but using um, data blocks. And for this, there's actually, you know, so many good examples in the tutorials and in the book, you've seen them all before. We don't need to talk about it um, too much. You know, we can basically say, okay, for the data block, the input will be an image, the output will be a category. Uh, this is just to do um, disease prediction. Um, um, the labeling function uh, will be the um, parent folder, parent label, uh, do a random split. 
the item and batch transforms we can copy and paste from what we had before. Um, and that creates a data block. So data loaders is then a data block dot data loaders. And you then have to pass in a source. So the source is um, basically anyth uh, uh, anything that you can um, uh, iterate through or index into to grab the things that will be passed to these to these blocks and to this function. Um, so for this, it's going to be a path. Um, and then we also need to get items. And so the th well, when we get a path, we're going to pass that path into the get image files function because that's the thing that returns a list of all of the images in a path. Um, and let's see if that works. How do you know that um, in the, okay, so the block, you have an image block, category block. Mm. <clears throat> how do you know that, like, how do you how do you know that the git image files is going to be able to feed both those blocks? Um, so, um, I guess the short answer would be you know to read the documentation about those blocks to see what they take and what they do, or any of the tutorials that use them. As you can see, they're used all over the place, right? So you mm -hmm. can start with this tutorial, or this tutorial, or this tutorial. Um, so any of those would show you what it does. Um, or yeah, the actual, let's so say this, this is not good documentation. I don't really never bother to look at this because it's, um, basically, all That's of not good. No, <laughs> we should fix that. Um, I guess because there's so many tutorials. I mean, as you can see, like <clears throat> I guess the reason I never really wrote docs for it is that it's literally a single line of code. So <laughs> that's like, <laughs> um, um, yeah. So maybe looking at the code is actually interesting in this case. So an image block is something which. Uh, calls class.create, where class is PIO image. So it's going to call PIO image.create. So um, to find out what's actually going to be called by it, you can go um, <clears throat> PIO image.create, and you can see it's going to get passed a file name, which can be a path or a string or various other things. So mm -hmm. um, get image files, then obviously you can you can either run it to see what it comes out with, or let's do that. So we could just run get image files, passing in the thing it's going to be given, which is the path. And so as you can see, it's a bunch of paths. And so we could pass one of those, copy that, and it's going to be passed into this function. So we've now just replicated exactly what's happening in the code. Um, yeah, but for this, I, I generally, yeah, I generally just look at the tutorials, which tell you what to and, do. Um, could you have, <clears throat> could you have two different get items that feed different blocks? We're, we're going to come to, we're going to come to that. Okay. okay. So park, park that. Um, so. Um, yeah, so, there was so also a batch transform, like if it gets transformed later after reading, uh, right? Because yeah, like, here we got the batch transform. Yeah. Uh, but, but in the in the image block, uh, because right now we have a pill image or something, and it needs to become a tensor, right? In yeah, that's right. It, it, it gets changed from an int okay. tensor to a float tensor later on. Cool. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's a yeah, that's a fairly subtle thing, but that's right. The um, um, we stick that in something image equals, uh, and we look at like uh, mp dot array image. It's actually stored as bytes or uint eight as they call it in PyTorch. Um, 
So yes, the um, this is going to add a batch transform that's going to turn that into a float tensor, which we can see what that's going to look like. You could run it here, I expect, to float tensor. The transformation that we're applying is 224, which is, is like a square image, correct? A 224 by 224? This one here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so this is doing data augmentation of uh -huh. lots of different kinds. So um, let's copy, doc, paste. Um, and if we show for data augmentation, looking at the docs is particularly important because you can see examples of the augmentations it does. So it tells you a list of all the augmentations and how you can change them. And here's some examples of what they look like. And These augmentations would happen after the int to float tensor, right? Uh, uh, yes, that's correct. And some data augmentations, they operate on the entire batch and some operate single example. Yeah, that's right. So the ones in batch transforms operate on a whole batch and the ones in item transforms operate on a single item. And so batch transforms um, operate because they operate on a batch. Before you get there, everything has to be the same shape. So it can be turned into a batch. So this resize resizes everything to the same shape. And then this does uh, these various different types of data augmentation. Um, and one of the key pieces of data augmentation it does is to um, randomly zoom into a subset of the image, as you can see in these various examples here. Um, and uh, this data block API, can you also use it with data frames where you would be reading your images from a data we are frame? Gonna do that. We're going to do that in a moment, yes. OK, cool. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like skipping over quite a bit of this because um, it's super well covered in the tutorials. So I don't want to like say stuff that you can very easily read, whereas the stuff I'm about to show you isn't as well covered in the tutorials and it's kind of new. Um, um, but yeah, feel free to keep asking questions about anything you see. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so all, all we've done is we've just, this is just the same thing that we have in lesson one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I just and and it's doing exactly the same thing as my image data loaders dot from folder, but just turn into a data block. And so that this is what I did, just to, sh to show you through my process. Was step one was to get this working, and then I um, uh, passed that into a learner, and I um, so let's go copy and. And I want this all to run as fast as possible. So I would use the fastest. Um, actually, let's do this vision learner copy. Do you, when you make this uh, data loader thing, do you try to make sure that the shape that it's outputting is what you need for your model? Or that's later? Well, I generally use models, uh, Hamel, which uh, don't care what size they get. Um, so yeah, that's one of my that's one of my tricks. Uh, so ResNet 18 is happy with any size. Um, so actually, for my testing, I'm going to bring this back down to 128, so it's super fast. And um, so I just want to get the maximum iteration speed here. And so now I can call learn dot fit one cycle. And let's do one epoch. Um, okay, so this is going to run in under 20 seconds, which is kind of what you want, right? You want something that you can test in under about 20 seconds, so that way you can just quickly try things and make sure that end-to-end -end it's working. Yep, the error rate is down to 30%, so that's, that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, one correlated question is, OK, I understand the input size, mm -hmm. but what about the output size of your data block? Like, you know that this is what you need for that model. You know, that's like, what I'm saying. The model doesn't care. The model's happy with any size. I mean, the targets. 
the, or whatever. You're talking about the labels? Yeah, the labels. I mean, labels don't have sizes. The labels are strings. Or just the, this, the shape of that, like, hey, like, is it, you know, because maybe different models are kind of trying to predict different types of stuff, potentially. I don't know. Uh, you know like some I mean, might so have shape of, of the A vision target. learner is, um, I suspect the thing you're kind of asking is the thing that we're going to be covering in a moment. So maybe put that on hold and then tell me if okay, it still doesn't sure. make sense. Okay. Okay. Um, Before yeah. we, I have a question. Hmm. Uh, on the data block, um, you randomly select uh, uh, the amount of records or the amount of uh, entry, uh, the batch size that you're going to process. I don't randomly pick the batch size. No, the batch size is actually selected in the dot data loaders call and it defaults right. to 64. 64. So what is the guarantee that, that every single one of the images in this particular case will be selected or there's no way to know? Is there any way to know that every single one will be? Uh, Yes. I'm I mean, well, I mean, there, yes, except that we're randomly selecting 20% to be our validation set. Um, but every then, single, every single one will go through the, through the learner? Of the, uh, of the 80% that aren't in there, everyone will go through our learner because we randomly shuffle them and then we iterate through the whole lot. So in, in a single epoch, in a single epoch the model is guaranteed to see every example that this you train just once uh -huh. no, yeah the, 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 yeah and that's what this one means that's what one epoch means is look at everything once and so if we put two there it'll look at everything twice but each time it randomly um, shuffles it so it does it in a different random order i have a quick question hmm. what uh i guess this is pytorch data loader stuff but what actually happens for the last batch uh, the last it's... batch, it depends. Uh, and this is actually not the PyTorch data loader. It's actually FastAI's data loader. So we have our mm -hmm. own data loader. Uh, although in the next version, we're likely to replace it with the FastAI one. Um, so it depends what drop last is. If drop last is true, uh -huh. then it deletes the last batch. Uh, and if it's false, then it includes the last batch. And the reason that's interesting is that the last batch may not be of size 64. 64. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the validation set, it always keeps the last batch. It's uh, super important to shuffle the train set. The first AI does it for you, but if you will you know, mess around with the data loaders or do something yourself, if you don't shuffle the train set, you might get very poor, poor training performance, yeah. even with a lot of- uh, When we used to use Keras, I used to mess all this stuff up all the time. Um, yeah, trying to get all those details right was really annoying. Just to make sure on something you said, you said in next iteration, you're going to replace it with the PyTorch data loaders? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. said fast AI, so it got confused. Oh, did I? Yeah, that is confusing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so that was my step one, is to just get it working uh, exactly like before. And then I ran, uh, then I ran it with, um, in the background on the same architecture for the same epochs to make sure I got about the same error rate, and I did. So then I was happy that, okay, I'm, I'm matching what we had before. Um, so then uh, step two was to try to make it so that the data block spits out uh, three things, which would be one image and two categories, um, the category of disease and the category of, of rice type. Um, so to get it to spit out uh, an image and two categories, hopefully you wouldn't be surprised to hear that we just um, do that. We say we want three blocks, an image and two categories. Now, um, this variety, we did some way of, of, of getting that given an image ID. Um, and actually the way I did it was a bit ugly. And since then I thought of a better way of doing it, which is what I think we should do is we should create a dict that maps from image ID to variety. And then our function will just be to, to look that up, right? So let's call this um, image to variety equals, okay. And it's gonna be a, a, dict, com a dict comprehension. So we're gonna loop through um, um, the rows in uh, df dot 
uh, editor items. Now I always forget what these differences are. Column name, comma, series pair. Returning a tuple with the column name. Okay, that's not what I want. Yeah, like iter rows, yeah. Seems. Yeah, iter rows. Index, <laughs> comma, series. Okay, cool. I think like this uh, editor tuples is the fastest one, um, but you know, this is not very big, so I don't. So well, let's keep it simple. Okay, so this is going to iterate over rows and return uh, index comma series. Okay, so we don't really care about the index. Um, uh, another thing we could do is make the image ID the index, and then you could actually jump straight into it. Um, but I think I'd rather not use pandas features. I'd rather use more pure Python-y things, because I think that'll make the explanation a little clearer. Um, so we're going to look through, it's going to give us the index and the row. Um, and so what we want is the uh, key will be the rows image ID and the value will be the rows variety. Variety. Okay, that looks good. Um, so then there's a couple of ways we could turn this into a function. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little neat trick, which is when you go like the, uh, let's pick out something. Let's say we're going to grab this one. When you go like this, um, behind the scenes, that square bracket thing is actually calling a special magic method in Python called dunder get item, uh, which is a function. So this is the cool thing about Python. It's so dynamic and flexible. Like all the syntax sugar is like behind the scenes, just calling functions, basically. That's exactly the same thing, right? And so that means that <clears throat> this function here, image to variety dot done to get item, is a function that converts a file name into a variety. So here's the cool thing. Uh, forget why you can pass it an array. And it's going to call each of those functions, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is rather nice. Um, so another thing I find helpful. OK, cool. So when I call that, um, it complains. And it says, oh, get y contains two functions, but it should contain one, one for each target. It thinks that there's only one target. Uh, why is that? Well, if you think about it, we've said there's three blocks, but we haven't told it how many of those blocks are for the independent variable and how many are for the dependent variable. And so we have to tell it. And the way we do that is just to say the number of inputs equals, and so is one. We have one input, and then the rest will be outputs. So when we do that, it's now happy. OK. Um, and Personally, before I jump to data loaders, I first create data sets just to make sure they work. So data sets are um, things where you can do, where you just grab one thing at a time. There's no mini batches to worry about. So data sets are easier to debug than data loaders. So you can create data sets using exactly the same approach. OK. And so, all right, so we've got an error. OK, so here's the problem. Um, it tried to look up our um, function. Um, and in fact, it's not indexed. It's not passing in the string of the name. It's actually passing in the path. And so that's why we got a key error. This path does not exist as a key in this dictionary, which is quite true, right? It doesn't. So. Um, what I think we should do is fix this up so that we've got train images, bacterial leaf streak, blah, blah, blah. Just to okay. be clear, yeah. the uh, get files function, the output of that is being passed to the get y, or get items is being passed to get y. Like, so get that, image that. files 
Um, yeah, so we haven't kind of gone into the details of exactly what's going on behind the scenes, Hamill. Um, okay. Let's do that in a moment. Okay. No problem. Um, I kind of like the way you're wanting to jump into the nitty gritty, um, but it's a little bit That's too a problem that up. I have. I'm trying, I'm trying to do more top down, right? So I'm going to get yeah. to your bottom up. We'll meet in the middle. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. By the way, your video is not on. That's which is fine. I just don't know if it's intentional. I always like to see people when they're, you know, seeable. Hello. Uh, okay. So um, we're not going to use this trick after all. We're going to create a function called uh, uh, called get variety. Uh, actually, no. Let yeah. Let's create a function called get variety. Um, and so it's going to get past um, a path. Okay, and so we're going to return um, image to variety, um, and we're going to return image to variety with the uh, name of the file. So the name of the file is a string. Um, uh, so wait, do we need image to variety dot the dunder thing? Oh, like square, not... yeah, or just square bracket actually, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, and then we need to use that. Obviously. Get underscore variety. Okay. So DSS. Um, contains a dot train data set. Okay, and it also contains a dot valid data set. Okay, and so we can look at the zeroth thing in the training data set, which is a single thing, right? So we can have a look now. There's an image and y1 and y2. And so then we can look at the image, for example. Okay, so what's happened here is that get image files returned a list of paths. The first one got passed to image block, which as we saw earlier, got passed to PIO image .create, And here it is. Um, and <clears throat> that path name also got passed to a function called parent label. In fact, let's do it, right? So let's uh, say file name equals get image files and then the thing that we passed in, training path. And let's just get the zeroth one. Okay. And so there it is, right? So um, it ended up calling PAO image.create with that file name. Okay. It also called parent label with that file name. Parent label. Okay. Um, and it also called get variety with that file name. Jeremy, can we look at get variety one more time? Absolutely. I'm just curious how you build the path. I didn't. I removed the path. I called dot name. Oh, okay. To just okay. Name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I see. Uh, yeah. In my original version of this, I did it the other way around of like building back up the path and then realized that that was mm -hmm. kind of stupid. So, um, yeah, it's unique, so that works. Uh, okay. um, one how, question. How we... oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, this could be too, you know, low level, but just let me know. Uh, can you have multiple get items? Is this the right place to ask that, or that's? Yeah, that, so it wouldn't make sense to have multiple get items, right? Like Ever? get item like... returns a single thing. But it could be yeah. anything you like, right? It could be it could return a tuple or a list or an object or whatever. Right, and so or a dict, and then get y and get x are then the things responsible for pulling out the bit that you need to pass to your blocks. Now okay. we don't okay. we don't need to get x because image blocks just take paths directly. So, so if I needed something a bit more, like I need, wanted to put more things and get image file, like have it emit a tuple. Yeah. Then would I have to like make my own image yeah. block to ignore? No, not your image block. You would write your own function, just like get image files, that returns the list of all of the objects you want, which have all the information you need. 
Okay, and then but like, like it almost never happens. I don't think that's ever happened to me because like nearly like nearly always there's like a row of a database table or a path or or something has all the information you need to like go out and get the stuff with your get x's and get y's. That's like the central piece of information for each row. And based on this information, you can read in text, you can read in images, yeah. but you know, specific to that uh, one row. So actually, be a... let me show you my hacky version because this is the version that uses a data frame. So this is, um, so the version that uses data frame, um, let's see. Yes, is, is, it, is it right oh, to um, think get yeah, items get as? Yeah, and that's interesting. Hang on, let me just do this and then we'll come to your question. Okay, so in this data block, mm -hmm. I started out with um, a data frame, um, like so, right? And so by passing into data block .data loaders, I passed in the data frame, um, it's going to get it's going to get each row, right? Mm -hmm. And so then uh, get y becomes call reader one, which is just a function which I mean, mm. it, let's look yeah. at it. It's that it doesn't do much. It um, let's see what it does. So it's got it's 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 done as an object because you can do things like add in a prefix path and a suffix path, and you can split it with a label delimiter and whatever. But basically, um, you know, all it's basically doing okay, and it like checks what kind of thing you're passing in. Um, but basically all it does is it calls uh, get atra to grab the column um, and we look here. Call reader for Panda, like uh, reading data frames? Sorry? Is this call reader function specifically for data frames? Uh, I mean, it, it, it can work with anything basically that that you're so what it's doing here is it's yeah it's saying um grab that column um but it's really you know I, i've only really used it for data frames but you could use it for anything um but yeah so basically here get y is saying okay well let's return the the index one field and the index two field mm -hmm. you know um and um, what's up with get x that yeah is... so so because now we're being passed uh so you can't pass a row of a database table to pal image.create so uh get x is this function um which basically is going oh it's going to be in the training path slash disease name slash um image name so that's, that's... Um... And then there's a special case for the test set because the test set things are not stored in subfolders according to label because we don't know the label. So it's just directly in the test path. So that's, the, the, as I said, this was more hacky. Um, I don't know. This, uh, this, this really helps. So like a get X is kind of like get Y, you can have a list in there. It's mm -hmm. it, it yeah. like from the- Yeah, you can have it. Yeah, it's totally flexible. And um, I mean, seriously, Hamill, like this, like, we have so many examples of all of these um, patterns in the docs, in the tutorials. So like this exact pattern, let, let, let's take a look at one, right? Docs.bastardai. Um, so tutorials, uh, let's do data block tutorial. Right here, look, multi-label. So here's one. And yeah, you can see here, this is even splitting based on mm -hmm. columns in the database table. And here's the call reader using pre the prefix. And here's a call reader using a label delimiter. And here's the examples coming out. Yeah. So there's um, yeah, lots of examples you can you can check out to see how to do all this. Um, yeah. So I think I'm at a point now where I actually do want to go into the weeds. So Hamel, you're now after this totally free to ask any super weedy questions. Um, the, um, the most basic kind of data block is called the transform block. And the transform block, 
um, uh, basically, um, it's going to store a bunch of things you pass in. It's going to store things called type transforms. It's going to store things called item transforms. It's going to store things called batch transforms. Um, and it also, it always adds one thing, which is to tensor, because PyTorch needs tensors. Um, if you look at the image block, we saw that that's defined as a transform block where the type transforms is this and the batch transforms is this. So now's a good time to talk about how this all works, what this does. So if I um, pass in here transform block and don't pass any transforms, it won't do anything, right? So um, if I, right, let's get rid of like, pretty much everything, right? But let's do that separate cell so it gets a little bit easier to read. Okay, here is the world's simplest data block. Okay, uh, so if we, um, all that. As you can see, all it does is it takes the output of get image file zero and turns it into a tuple containing one thing, which is the thing itself. If we have two transform blocks, it returns a tuple with two things in it. So um, and the reason it's returning tuples is because this is what we want. When we train, we have batches, right, containing inputs and outputs, potentially multiple inputs and potentially multiple outputs, right? So that's why, you know, indexing into this gives you back a tuple. Minor uh, question. Yes. The blocks, the blocks can either be a list or a tuple? I don't know, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no idea. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so then we can like do stuff to um, the first thing in the tuple. Uh, so get x equals, um, say, let's create a lambda o, o dot name. Taking a while. Hey, what are you doing? Oh. Something to do with Lambda, right? Does name have to be called? No. Hmm. Maybe it's notebook restart time. It might hmm. well be notebook restart time. Oh, that's... Oh, uh, I wonder if something happened to my GPU server. I mean, something has happened to my GPU server, clearly. Never happened before. Oh, it looks like it's back. Oh, okay, it just recognized that it disappeared. Uh. That's wild. Oh, okay. I'm very, uh, I don't know what just happened. I guess it doesn't really matter. What are you, what are you doing right now? I'm just looking at the log, see if anything just happened.
be nice. Um, okay. Okay, so you see what happened here is um, we, you know, got the first thing from image files, which was this, and um, get x got its name. So we could also do uh, get y equals lambda o o dot parent. So Okay, so um, it first went like first the, the that thing went to the transform block uh, get items yes yeah, so, so whatever get items got went to transform blocks and That's then right. it went to get x and get y. Uh, well, transform block doesn't do anything, right, um, at all unless you pass it transforms. So yeah, so it's basically. Um, but the number of them you have is the number of like pipelines it's gonna it's gonna create. So if we created another one, but, but generally, if you have like an image block, it would do something. So the, the order we're gonna we're the... gonna get to that. Yeah. So here, look, we've now got the order. We're 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 not quite there yet, right? So let's get to that. Um, and it's not quite the mental model you've got, I think. Now that I've got three transform blocks, I only have things to create two of them so it's it's sad right mm -hmm. um and so we could um put them here mm -hmm. for instance um and the that mean, those, the last one is the y and the first two are the x correct basically. unless we say number of inputs equals one Right, in which case now get x is just going to have to return one thing, it's going to be one function, and get y will be two things. Okay, um, so um, you could um, you know, you could even put it here instead, right? So you could say, oh, well, this is actually, um, let's move it. We could put it here, item transforms equals. And so the stuff, the transform block is stuff that is applied for that transform. Um, why is that not working? That's slightly surprising to me. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's to be a type transform. Okay, type transform. So it's now converted to the type it's meant to be. So, uh, have, uh, Radic, you were asking about image block. I, I'm just, uh, you know, oh. curious how all the pieces interact. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm loop let me show you. Over all these things. Let me show you. So, um, let's do it manually. So, image block is just this. Okay. So, let's not use image block. Let's instead. Why didn't the item transform work? Let's figure uh, that out later. Yeah, once we figure out what's going on here and then we'll debug it. Okay, so now we've got three transform blocks, two of them which do nothing. And the first one of which is going to call something.create. That was PAL image.create. Um, so transform blocks don't, if you look at the code of them, transform blocks don't do anything at all, right? They actually, they only store things. There's no, 
There's no done to call. There's no forward. <laughs> there's nothing. Transform blocks don't do anything. They just store stuff. Um, the data block is the thing that's then going to go through and say, OK, for each thing, call its type transforms, and then call to tensor, and then call its item transforms, and then at data loader time, call its batch transforms. So does that help answer your question, Hamel? It's not that a, tran a, a transform block doesn't get called. It just stores the list of things that will get called at each of these times. The first thing that gets called is type transforms. Um, uh, wait, is that right? Let me think. Um, no, that's not correct. The first thing that gets called is get x and get y. And then the result of that is passed into type transforms. And so get x and get y. So get x would be responsible for making sure that you have a path that you can pass to PAO image.create. That's the order. So this whole path of what happens in what sequence that lives in the data block. That lives in data block, exactly. Now the data block code is frankly hairy and it could do with some, you know, simplifying and documenting and refactoring. Um, it's not long, it's about 50 or 50 or 60 lines of code. Um, in fact, it's almost all here, but basically, um, when you call dot data sets, really all it's doing is it, is it creates a data sets object passing in all of the type transforms um, to it. And the answer to your question, uh, Hamel, why didn't the item transforms get done is because item transforms actually get done by the data loader, not by the data sets. So data sets only use the type transforms. And basically the only reason there's like quite a bit of code in here is we try to kind of make sure that if two different things have like the same type transforms, we kind of merge them together in a, in a sensible way. So there's some stuff to try to make sure this all just works. Um, I, I was going to ask the, the type transforms are separate from the items transforms because of some optimization you can do with the type transforms? Um, the because uh, the type transforms are, they're happening earlier. They're happening before um, uh, data loaders time. So data loaders are the things that are going to take tensors, right? Um, uh, so, uh, or at least things get, that can be converted into tensors. So um, yeah, so type transforms are the things that are going to create your data sets for you. And they're going to spit out things which need to be convertible into tensors. And then, then data loaders has item, item transforms, which are things like reshaping everything to the same size, and batch tra transforms, which are things like data augmentation. But you can have a, an item transform run on the GPU or not on the GPU, right? It depends on the ordering. Or... Um, Does it I run? don't think an item transform is generally going to run on the GPU because it's not a batch yet. Mm. I mean, I, maybe it's theoretically right. possible, but that would be pretty mm. weird because you, yeah, you really would need things to be in a batch before the GPU can be optimizing it effectively. Right. And everything in batch transforms will run on the GPU. Um, assuming that you're using a GPU, I mean, there is a, um, there, this is, okay, this is some the part of the code base we're not looking at today, but if you, there, there is a, uh, I can't remember, I think this might be a callback, which sticks things on the GPU. Uh, so it just depends yes. on whether things are before or after that callback. Um, Good callback. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that, that's probably a bit of a distraction. So let's skip that bit for now. To, uh, to kind of revise the difference between data set and data loader, is it best to revisit the PyTorch documentation and kind of- Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. We have our own implementation of them, but our implementation of data loader is a superset of PyTorches. And PyTorch's uh, data set is like, literally it's an abstract class. It doesn't do anything at all. It's just, uh, so a data set is something that you can index into and it returns a single tuple of your independent and dependent variables. That's what a data set's defined as by PyTorch. Um, and therefore that's what we do as well. Uh, a data loader 
is is you can't index into it. The only thing you can do is is iterate through it. You can grab the next one, and it gives you a mini batch, which is a tensor. So that's the okay. difference. But yeah, this is a that's a PyTorch concept. Um, uh, I guess I'm trying to understand the type transform thing. Why it has to be done in the data set before the data loader? Well, it doesn't have to be, but it's it's like we want data sets. Like data sets are a very convenient thing to have to have something you can like go into and grab items. You know, numbered x, y, or z. That's that's the basic foundation of the PyTorch data model. You know, is that there's things you can. No, I'm asking the, the type transform aspect of it. Like yeah, so you need you need something that converts uh, the output of get image files into what you want in your data set, and that thing needs a name, and the name we gave it was type transforms. Okay, I think I think I understand. Okay, like you, this is not the only way you could do this. Right, but it's 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 our way that's really nice because we now have this thing that you can say like, oh, Hamel, can you show me the fourteenth image and its label? And you can say yes, no problem, Jeremy. You type dss dot train bracket thirteen, and and they, there it is, right? So um, yeah, so that's just a convenient thing, basically. Um, so I, I I guess a question around that is that if we did not have type transforms, then it would just be one more step in the item transforms, right? Yeah, like, I think so. Your, so it is your, just your data those sets, out. Your, yeah, your data sets would always just return a single thing, or maybe the, the mm -hmm. probably two things: the get x and get y results, and then your data loader would have to do more work, basically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, which it would be as perfectly okay way to do things as far as I can tell that I think would be a little harder to debug and work with and keep things decoupled. Um, yeah, I think it's a reasonable comment. Um, so is it like anything you want to do up front that is like kind of uniform across your whole data set, maybe put it in the type transform that you don't need to change at training time? Um, Basically, like anything that you want to be able to like index into it and look at that thing, really, you know. Um, if you're not sure okay. where to put it, I'd say just chuck it somewhere and don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, um, like like t you know, we kind of put the the rule is that you know you need something that um, can be turned into a tensor. Like that's that's the way fast AI does it. So you need to make sure that your type transform, when you're working with FastAI, returns something that is a tensor or going to be turned into a tensor, which a PIL image can be, for example. OK. I think I understand. It's kind of like a, you, want just, you want to make sure it's like a convenient thing that you understand to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, so then like. Um, okay, so I can remove all that because that is that this is the definition of image block. So let's replace it with the word image block. Okay, um, and then um, let's change. Um, okay, let me think. Uh, okay, so let's pop a dot name here. Um, here's kind of something we want as our label, right? That's one of our labels. And then the other label we wanted um, was the uh, function called get variety, right? Um, now we can't, th this breaks our rule. This can't be turned into a tensor because it's a string. So um, what do we do about that? Um, you might remember from a previous lesson, we learned that what we do is we replace strings with integers where that integer is a lookup into a vocabulary. It's a list of all of the possible options. So um, if we, 
change this to category block. That is exactly what category block will do. Right? Um, and so category block. It's got a type transform code categorize, which I'm not going to go into because it's not particularly exciting. Um, but if you look up the documentation for categorize, you can see how it does that. So basically, internally now, you'll find that the that the vocab is stored for for these things. So if we if we look at this at the high level, get items get us. By the way, take just about here's the vocab. Right, it's got two things. It's got the vocab for the diseases and the vocab for the um, varieties. Yeah, sorry, Radu, go on. No, no worries. So get items gets us the rows or the examples or whatever allows us to, like the, the, the core for a single example. And then from get items, we use get y or get x to transform it somehow so that we can pass it into those blocks. Correct, right? specifically and pass it into the type transforms of those blocks. Into type transforms and tra type transforms are things that yeah can get triggered, um, right? So they're doing a little bit something similar to get y, but like are building on what get y does. Correct, right, right, exactly. Right. Because because these are like very general things, right? And so I didn't want you guys to have to write your own every time. So mm. these 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 basically say I this says I will work if you can pass me. A path to an image. And this says, I will work if you pass me a string. And so get X and get Y then are responsible for ensuring that you pass them a path and pass this one a string. And get image files is already returning paths, so we don't need to get X for this guy. Um, but it's not returning strings, so we do need to get Y for these guys. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna run it slightly over time, um, but let's have a look at, um, so this I is exactly, yeah. okay. So this is exactly the same as what we just had, right? And so then we also then add the two things, which is the item transforms and the batch transforms. Some other time we will talk about how it is that how come this is not being applied to the categories? It's only being applied to the images. Um, for those of you interested in skipping ahead, the secret is using the fast cause type dispatch functionality. Um, um, anyway, so that's that's why we're getting these three different things. The image, we've got Y1. So Jeremy, if we had an image, if we had an image block in uh, our, for our Ys, for our targets, Yes. The item transform would get applied. Correct. Oh wow. Okay. Correct. Cool. And there's a there's a have a look at the Siamese tutorial on the fast AI docs because that has two images. Um, yeah. And like if you think about it, anytime we do segmentation, that's exactly what's happening, right? The data augmentation is happening to X and Y. And this is like really unusual. I don't know of any other libraries that have this kind of totally transparent ability to do bounding boxes, segmentation, point clouds, whatever as dependent variables and have it all happen in unison very, very automatically. Um, or at least it didn't used to be. Um, maybe there is now. Um, okay, so, um, so now I can create data loaders from that. Um, and thanks to the magic of fast AI, this is so cool, check this out. It's actually auto, auto labeling it with each of our categories. So thanks to um, stuff we'll discuss later, basically this stuff called um, uh, type dispatch. Fast AI does a lot of things automatically, even though I don't think I've ever like explicitly coded this to work, it just, does because of how the API is designed. Um, so we now have something which can create batches of, of um, pictures and two different dependent variables, each one of which has a category. Um, and so 
Um, what we will get to next time is it actually turns out, well, I briefly mentioned it now, actually. Um, all that stuff I did last time about messing around with like multiple different heads and all that is actually totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. All we need to do when we create our vision learner is tell it we don't have, we don't want 10 outputs, but we don't want 20 outputs. So normally it automatically figures out how many outputs you want by how many levels are in your categorical dependent variable. But in this case, we've got something custom, right? Which is we've got a, a, a tuple of outputs. So we have to tell it we want 20 outputs. That's going to make the final matrix that it multiplies by have 20 outputs. Now, then you basically need to tell it what loss function to use. Um, and so if you look it up, it turns out we used to use a loss function for this called cross entropy loss flat. So we're going to call that exact loss function on the first 10 items, and we're going to compare that to the disease probabilities. And then the second 10, we're going to compare to the variety probabilities. And we'll do the same thing for having an error rate, which just looks at the first 10, you get the error rate for disease. And the same thing for variety, look at the second 10, the variety. And so basically then if you train that, it's going to print out the disease and the variety error, and the loss function will be the loss function on both um, both of the two halves. And um, interestingly, for this single model, this 2.3% disease error is the best I'd ever got for this architecture. So at least for you know for this single model case, this was better than um, um, training something that only predicts disease. Anyway, we can talk about that more later because um, yeah, we kind of spent more time. I have a quick it. question. Yeah. The last layer, it's 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 a flat 20, uh, 20 output layer. Does this mean at inference time that uh, we would have to do the soft max plus, uh, what would it be? I can't remember. No, fast AI handles all that for you automatically. All right, yeah. okay. Great. All right. And and by the way, in the inference uh, functions, you'll see there's like always a Boolean options as to like whether to decode it and whether to put the final activation function on it mm. and stuff like that. So um, actually, now I think about it in this case, because we used a custom loss function, I think right. that would have broken its ability to do it automatically. So yeah, okay, I'm going to say actually, you would need to add a soft max if you wanted to. Although, um, you actually don't need to because like at, at least for the Kaggle competition, I just needed the um, which disease had the highest prediction and whether it's softmax or not, it's going to be the same because that's a um, monotonic function. So it depends whether you actually need probabilities or not. In, in my case, right. I, didn't, I didn't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you would only look at the first ten or the second. I guess correct, the first one correct, is the correct. disease. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so you like, just you can see it because here. otherwise, yeah. Um, so I was using TTA, right, mm -hmm. to do test plane augmentation, and right. I stacked up and I did an ensemble of TTA, and then I just did an argmax on the yeah first yeah. ten. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Use uh, hold yeah. on. Okay, sure. Uh, in the architecture, uh, you selected for ResNet eighteen hundred and twenty-eight. Um, is there any programmatic way to find out the size of or the input size of the models that you are trying to use? Uh, these models handle any input size. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, res all the ResNets and all the ConfNexts handle any input size. All right, thank you. It's, it's only the transformer models that don't. That also tripped me up in the beginning, but there's a lot of interesting stuff there that might take a whole lecture to understand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And all that, so yeah. Thanks, gang. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.